my executive producer has the week off. So today it's just me introducing the program to you. Live from New York, it's show and tell. Action. I'm Billy. Welcome back. This is a weekly podcast generally about vintage knitting, but sometimes I go on detours. I am the traveler, you know. Today we're going to be taking a little side adventure to Portugal. We're going to talk about handkerchiefs. We're going to talk about knitting, of course. And I'll show you some things I'm working on and some things I'm hoping to work on. And then we're going to have a little contest. So first up, I'd like to share with you the Billy bag. I couldn't name it the the fill-in-the-blank bag because that's trademarked by a very prominent French company. But I am working on my interpretation of a bag that sells for sometimes over $100,000 because often it's made in crocodile or alligator or other exotic skins. Mine is made of wool. So I have a lot of strings and cables and things hanging here, but let me try and walk you through where I'm at. This is the front of the bag, and there's a top panel that some belt-like thing will lace through. So these are just some markers of where I've made buttonholes and where things are going to come through. The side panels I've knit up but I'm having to rip them back because I didn't know when I first knit them where these buttonholes were going to be. So I rip back to here and I've knit up to the buttonhole and proceeded on. Um, so this will fold and be sort of like a pleated side to the bag. And for the purposes of my prototype, I, I knit the back just in stockinette that's where I'm up to at the moment. I'll be continuing on and hope to have more to show you next time around. I've also been making progress with my V-back tee. I've talked about this before, how I knit an entire sweater, not in this pattern, tried it on, didn't like how it draped on my body and decided to try a completely different pattern, which had quite a bit of ease the V-back tee. This is a sweater that can be worn with the V in the front or in the back. Now, I intend to wear it with the V in the front because I think that this will give a more slenderizing look. Also, V-necks always allow me the opportunity to wear jewelry. See, if I had a V-neck, you would see these beads better. Anyway, um, Originally, when I knit the V-back tee, I had knit it with long sleeves and again, tried it on, didn't like how it was looking. It was too big in all the wrong places. So I pulled that back. This is like the third or the fourth time I'm knitting this sweater, but finally I'm happy with the results. One modification that I made, the pattern tells you to cast on at the neckline, like many yoke sweaters. Instead, what I did was I started after the ribbing. So I cast on the number of stitches that I would have after I would have done the ribbing. I did a provisional cast on. And then I, correction, I did not do a provisional cast on. I cast on those stitches around the neck. And then I came back and I picked up stitches. And the reason I did that and not a provisional cast on was I thought it would give me more stability. I found with one of my previous versions that it was so loose around the neck that it just kept stretching and stretching until the neck was slipping off of my shoulders. So I thought having that extra little band of stitches where I went around and picked up would maybe give it a little more stability. Also, because I was knitting towards my neck as opposed to down from it, I could make my ribbing as long as I needed to. So right now it's here, but when I'm all done, if I have yarn left over and I wanna make this a smaller neckline, 
I'll be able to open up my bind off and continue knitting upwards and make my ribbing as deep as I want it to be. So let me stand up and show you the full length of this at this point. I'm up to here. I still have yarn, so I intend to knit this longer, but I'm pretty happy with how it's gathering and uh, you know, pretty happy with the drape. Um, the yarn is a very interesting yarn. It's called Splash by Lang. I think it's cotton and it's like a, a tape. It's like a ribbon, it's flat. And there are all these little blips of darker blue in it. It's very unusual to knit with, doesn't really have give. And when you get to one of those big blips, you don't exactly know whether you should pull it all the way through or let it be where it wants to be. So it makes a very haphazard design, which I find very interesting, very attractive, and love the color. So that's where I'm at with that. Both of these projects are kind of winding down, and I started to get concerned about where I'm going next. I don't really want to knit with wool as I'm coming into the summertime in New York, and it's, what is it, 60 something degrees today, and there have already been days where it's approaching the 80s. So I expect that in the not too distant future, it's gonna be a little warm and yes, we'll have the air conditioning on. But I was really hoping to do a cotton project. And now it looks like I'm not ready to proceed with that. Let me explain. I was hoping to make this 1950s blouse. Some of my more astute viewers may recognize that this is not knit. This is crochet. I'm not a crocheter, but I love this blouse so much that I'm prepared to do virtually anything to create this blouse. So here's my crochet story. It was my mother who taught me to knit. I was four years old. My mother knew how to make the chain stitch, but she really wasn't a crocheter. So when I saw in a women's magazine, something like a Ladies Home Journal or, oh, what were those, McCall's or, you know, one of those old fashioned women's magazines, I think I was finishing high school, maybe just getting ready to go off to college when I came upon this advertisement in the magazine for a beautiful Afghan. I just fell in love with it. I thought it was the most gorgeous thing that I'd ever seen. And they were selling the kit. Well, it turned out that it was crochet and I didn't know how to crochet and I couldn't turn to my mother to help me to crochet. So I went to my best friend whose mother both knit and crocheted and I asked her if her mother would show me the few stitches that I needed to achieve this afghan. Let me grab the afghan to show you. I don't know the dimensions of it, but here's one corner and Let me back up even more. Can you see the full length of it? I don't think you can. It goes to here. So it's fairly large. Let me show you a close up of this. It's not your typical granny squares. That was the thing that appealed to me. I don't like the look of granny squares, but I was a student of geometry. And this afghan was made up of pieces that were all six-sided. Notice this ruffle. I liked the three-dimensionality of it, whereas granny squares are generally flat. And sometimes they have those flowers. I wasn't into that. This actually had instructions for making little yellow rosebuds and green leaves. And I made them, but I never attached them because I didn't want those colors. So I just stuck with this all ivory color and I don't use this all the time, but it comes out on occasion. Sometimes if I have a guest and I need an extra little blanket beyond the blankets that I have, 
it's a handy thing to have. So I crocheted this, this entire thing. It took a long time. Putting it together was a bit of a pain. Anyway, I love that blouse. And I thought, well, maybe I should try and pick up my crochet hook once again and attempt to make a garment this time. The pattern for the blouse that I showed you calls for number 30 crochet thread. Once upon a time, I had knit a sweater using this gray. It is crochet thread, but I had knit with it. I really don't know too much about crochet. I know that the numbers, the higher the number is, the finer it is. So 100 is finer than 30. This has a different numbering system. This is the label from this ball. And it says that it's pure cotton number two and a half to three. So perhaps that is a number three, which is much thicker than a number 30. This is already pretty thin. I only own two vintage crochet hooks. This is the smaller of them. It's a double O. I have no idea how many millimeters that is. But I started to crochet one of the motifs, those leaves. And this is the stem of the leaf. And then the leafy part is going to protrude out from here. But I can already see that this is huge. The leaves in the blouse were more like half the size of this because there were a bunch of them scattered around. So I already know that this hook is too thick. This thread is too thick. And I'm out of my element. And I'm not embarrassed to admit that. I am presently looking for someone in the crochet community. If you know someone who's expert and does vintage, please refer them to me. I'm looking for someone to collaborate much in the way that I did with Roxanne Richardson, but really I would like somebody who would help me learn how to crochet and perhaps help other knitters learn how to crochet because that blouse to me is really worth it. So I'll be back uh, to talk about that in the future. Hopefully, like wish me luck, hopefully I can get that off the ground. Now, the next thing that I am planning to work on, I've mentioned it before. Let me pull up a picture, hang on a second. This is for the rink and the links. It took me a while to master the name and I finally came up with a mnemonic. Rink begins with R, links begins with L, right, this is my left, right and left. Often I say right and left as opposed to left and right, but mainly my father's name began with an R and his wife's name began with the L. And they were very clever people when they would put their orange juice glasses that they didn't finish at breakfast, Back in the refrigerator, they made a point of putting his, Ralph's, on the right, and hers, Lil, on the left. Clever, right? It takes a college professor to figure that out. So anyway, now I have mastered. This is for the rink and the links. 1930, I'm pretty sure it's 1932 pattern. It's three colors. And I have been struggling as usual with what three colors I should choose. So today we're going to play a little bit of a game. I've shown you before a pair of brown suede shoes that I bought that are a vintage reproduction. Let me pull up a picture of the shoe along with some of the yarns that I'm considering. Hang on one second. I would like to knit that sweater to coordinate with these shoes. And I have been looking for months now for one brown yarn from anywhere in the world, from any manufacturer, I don't care. Brown fingering, something wool, mainly wool, 
could have some cashmere, could have some yak. I don't care. I just want it to be a winter sweater because the shoes are suede. I'm not planning to wear them in the summertime. So finding a single brown, I've looked at hundreds of browns and with great difficulty, I finally came up with a couple of options. So I wanted to show you today the different colors from two manufacturers that I'm considering. And we're gonna play this game. If you can figure out which colors I finally settled on, I will be sending a prize your way. So manufacturer number one, I was considering from amongst these five colors, the pink tone, easy. You know I'm going with A, so that's a give me. But which brown, B or E? And which red, D or C? If you think I'm choosing this manufacturer, make those selections. If you think I'm going with this other manufacturer, again, your give me is this shade. It's not exactly brown. Neither of these are really a true brown. They seem to have a lot of the burgundy color in them. But I thought they harmonized pretty well with the shoe. So that's your give me on this one, G. Which pink, which red, F or I, and then H or J. In the comments below, please put which colors you think that I finally settled on. And in an upcoming episode, I will reveal when I open my package, you'll be able to see who the manufacturer was and which colors I decided to go with. I've talked before about my love of travel. And I've also mentioned recently that I am hoping to go this year to Shetland Wool Week. It's a little bit of a pipe dream, I must say. If it wasn't for COVID, I know I'd be on the plane. But it looks like a bit of a complicated place to get to. Nevertheless, I digress. The picture you're looking at is the medieval walled city of Obidos, Portugal. I was there a handful of years ago, and I actually walked this wall. Now, I didn't walk the entire circumference of the city, but these little dots that you see back here, those are people who are walking along that wall. In some of these narrow streets are some of the most adorable shops you'll ever see. The streets of this town are just adorable. Cobblestones everywhere, little white houses with red terracotta tile roofs, and the shopping street. This bakery at the end of one of those charming streets has been owned and operated by the same family since the 1800s. If you haven't been to Portugal, let me tell you, it has perhaps the best bread anywhere. I've eaten bread in France, I've eaten bread in Italy and other places that are famous for their bread. I found the bread in Portugal to be absolutely delicious and this place is a must not miss. It was along this Darling Street that I purchased the blouse that I'm wearing. Just a second, let me take off my sweater to show you a better view. I just think it has such an interesting combination of shapes and fabrics and lace and whatnot that I have come up with the idea. You already know that I'm a very nostalgic person and I have saved all the handkerchiefs from my mother and my grandmother that I found in their possessions. Here you see just a, a mound of them. It looks like whipped cream, if you ask me. It's so delicious. But let me give you a little bit of an up-close view of just how, how lovely they are. And each one is completely different. This one was mine, has my initial on it. 
Sometimes they have embroidery and open work. Here's another one, very subtle applique flowers, white on white with a little pink embroidery. Sometimes they have more elaborate embroidery. Here's my mother's initial for her maiden name. Here's another little forget-me-nots or violets or something. Suffice it to say that I have many of these. And I had the thought of trying to assemble these by hand, stitching them together. I don't want to run them through a sewing machine. I think they're too delicate. But I was thinking of trying to create a blouse like this using handkerchiefs. And especially since this has this handkerchief bottom, it gave me that idea. So that's another project that I'm hoping to embark upon. There are a few steps that I have to take before I can really begin this project. First of all, I really would like to launder these and have them be as white as they could be without using any kind of chlorine bleach. That's a big no-no for any kind of vintage fabric. So I've been reading up on that. If anyone has any tips or suggestions that they've successfully used, please put that in the comments for us. But I've consulted Martha Stewart's website and a few other websites that specialize in vintage lingerie, vintage linens. And it seems like there are products out there that involve hydrogen peroxide and something called washing soda, which is different from baking soda, um, or non-chlorine bleaches. There's oxi oxygen bleach, I think it is. Oxygen or hydrogen? I think it's oxygen bleach, and I think that's what OxyClean is. I'm just not sure if OxyClean is considered gentle or delicate. So I tried just wool light on one of them to see what that would do, and I didn't think it whitened it. I know that you have to put them out in sunlight after you wash them. I've tried vinegar, I've tried lemon juice. I've tried a, a few different things on hankies that I don't care as much about. But I'll be keeping you posted as I progress with this. Another thing that I learned is when you have something that has embroidery on it, I don't know if you can see, they're little French knots in certain places. When you press these, you are supposed to press them onto something soft, like an ironing board pad, face down so that they stay clumped up. If you iron them on the right side, those things will get flattened out. So it seems like all along when my mother and my grandmother had these, they must have known not to iron them on the right side. I do remember seeing my grandmother wash her hankies in the, in the bathroom sink, and then she would stick them on the tile wall of her bathtub, and they would cling because they were wet. They would cling to the tiles, and as they dried, they would just fall off. No need to iron. So I don't know how she came up with that idea, but it's pretty clever. I want it to be a little bit more um, crisp. So I'm probably going to iron them. Anyway, this is something that you can follow along with me as I progress into it. I might end up having to do some kind of little knit lace work to fill in parts in between because these are not all the same size, if you notice. Um, they're all square, but of different dimensions. So. I love adventures. This is a new one for me. Actually, a few new ones. 
put forward in this episode. So that's all for this week. I almost forgot to tell you, I usually talk about my vintage jewelry. First of all, the earrings belong to my mother. I think that they're probably from the 50s or 60s. But recently I picked up these milk glass beads at a small antique shop in Forest Hills Gardens, Queens, New York, a little out of the way place. The guy had some really lovely things and very well priced because it's not Manhattan where I'm accustomed to shopping. So these are milk glass. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with milk glass from objects like this that probably everybody's grandmother had. I used to think this stuff was the ugliest things. I, I don't know, it didn't resonate with me. The one I chose to show you is kind of pretty. I just pulled it off the internet. I wouldn't mind owning that. Not too uh, ornate or weird shape. But I've looked at a lot of jewelry in my life and I had never seen milk glass in jewelry. So I grabbed these. The price was right and I thought in the summer I love to wear white clothes. I have many white sweaters, including this one. I showed this in my very, very, very first episode. I don't think I've ever worn it, but I had it on a hanger and I showed. It's called the Neil Jacket. And the Metropolitan Museum not too long ago did a retrospective on the artist, Alice Neal, who this jacket is named after. Maybe I'll put a link in the show notes in case you want to go and look at some images from that show. I have some guests coming up pretty soon. So, so these are a few adventures that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. And until next time, take it easy. Stay well, stay safe.